Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Spirit of Fire Fellowship. I'm Pastor Mike May here in the great city of Richmond, Virginia. And we want to welcome you to our online virtual service today. Uh, like I said, as you can see, we're virtual today. Uh, we've been in person uh, the past few weeks and we're excited about it. Uh, but today, due to scheduling conflicts uh, with the location, we are virtual. We will be resuming next week, though. We will be resuming in person as well as online as well next week. And so we just thank God for you all tuning in. I miss seeing your faces already. And so on behalf of my wife, Pastor Raquel, and myself, we just want to say welcome to everybody. Um, so listen, everybody, we have been in our series dealing with the love of God. This is Love Month. And we've been dealing with love. We started out in January dealing with honor. And then we are uh, wrapping up this month dealing with the love of God. Um, but today um, I have a different topic, not a different topic. I'm still in the love of God, but I want to come from another angle as well on this. So we're going to be wrapping up this series. Um, but one of the things I want to talk to you to you today about is right motives, right motives. And um, before we get going, I want to welcome all of our first timers that are out there. If this is your first time tuning in to a message and to a worship service, we just want to acknowledge you. If you would like to just go ahead and put in the comments section where you're logging in from, where you're looking at, um, whether it's local or global. Uh, we just want to thank you for tuning in today. We know that there are many other platforms that you can be on, but you've chosen to be on this one today. And so we just want to say thank you for tuning in uh, this morning. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and, and get moving with it. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to jump into the, to today's message. Father, we just thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. I thank you that revelation knowledge of your word will flow freely from heaven, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. None of me, all of you. Holy Spirit, speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind to bring wisdom, knowledge, and good understanding of the Word of God. We do approach your holy written word reverently, and so we just thank you for it now. Father, we thank you that every ear is anointed to hear and every heart is open and ready to receive the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save our souls, and we just bless you for it now. We covet the gifts of the Spirit to be in operation and demonstration as needed. We thank you for lives that will be transformed and changed. We thank you for right now the revealing of your truth, the revealing of your word with simplicity and understanding. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you for healing. We thank you for emotional healing. We thank you for mental healing. Father, we thank you right now that people are being stabilized in your word and, and strengthening your word and strengthening love. And so we thank you that we walk in this divine love that you've deposited in our hearts and that you've made available for us to walk in. And so we just bless you and we just thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Psalm, um, the 17th Psalm, verse 3. The 17th Psalm, verse 3. Uh, we've been talking about the love of God. We've been dealing with this love, this agape love, this we talked about the four different types of love that the Bible refers to. Uh, we talked about um, eros love, the love between a man and a woman. We talked about um, the phileo love, the, the brotherly love, and then also the storage love. And that's the, this is similar um, so far as a brotherly affectionate love, the love for humanity, the love that we have one for another. And then we start digging into the agape of God. God's unconditional love, his love that is supernatural, that has been deposited in our hearts. When you get born again, it's deposited in your heart. And so we've been talking about this. We've been dealing with this. Um, but today, um, even as I was preparing and getting ready, one of the things that I thought about and the thought that came to me was right motives, you know, dealing with right motives. How are we motivated to do what we do? When the love of God reigns supreme, it causes our motives to be purified. And I'm going I'm to talk to you. I don't want this just to be a message. Um, I don't want this just to be a message where you're just getting information. I want transformation to take place. I want us to get this word to actually change us. I want us to begin to adhere to this word. I want us to develop in this word. I don't want to just preach this. I'm not just preaching this just to preach another message and just to say, hey, okay, I feel the quota for this week. 
of me just speaking this word. No, I want this word to challenge us. I want this word to change us. And so that's what we go into the word for. As a preacher, I don't go into the word to get a message to preach. I go into the word to eat and to meditate and to live by. And now if it tastes good to me, I deliver it to you. If the Lord tells me to do a particular message, then there are times, yes, I need to study to get more information about it so I can deliver it. But even when I go in to study it, I go in as a student of it. I go in as a disciple of Christ to say, okay, this is what you want me to do. This is how you want me to live. And so now I have to take on the mind of Christ. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through the transformation chamber of this word to now deal with. So if, if there are wrong motives, I want this thing to check motives on the inside of you. I want us to check on the inside of myself as well myself included, that if anything is wrong, that the light of God's word will shine on those dark areas and bring it to light to us today so we can start making changes so we can become better and walking this thing out. Amen. So let's, let's dig into this. Now, um, this message, um, this word that I'm um, sharing with you right now, this is the NET version. And one of the things, that's the New English Translation. Um, in Psalm, the 17th Psalm, verse three, and it says, you have scrutinized my inner motives. You have examined me. This is David speaking here. He says, You've ex you have scrutinized my inner motives. You have examined me during the night. You have carefully evaluated me, but you find no sin. I am determined I will say nothing sinful. So his heart was to say nothing sinful. Now, David was a complex dude. And so you got to understand, this is a guy who God says he's a man after my own heart. But if you see David's life, you begin to see David did walk in some sin. David did some things, man, that was that was suspect, that was questionable, that was horrific even. But he always had this heart towards God that, God, I want to get it right. I want to do better. I want to be better. And so he'll go to God. It's like, Lord, examine me. Judge me. Show me who I am. But then it's like this. Okay, you have examined me during the night. In other words, you've examined me in those dark spaces, dark places, those quiet times when nobody is around. You are showing me, you, you, you are seeing the real inner workings of me. You know me, God. Even if I put on a face for others, you really know me. You can examine my heart. You can begin to see why I do what I do. I can, I can try to get over on people. I can try to tell them that, no, I didn't mean that when I said that, or I didn't mean that when I did that, knowing that you really did mean that when you said it and you did it. Now, all of a sudden, now he's saying, okay, God, you've examined me during the night. You've carefully evaluated me. How many of us can really say that, Lord? Or even say it to a degree. He says, you carefully evaluated me, but you find no sin. I'm determined. But this is the thing. He says, I'm determined. I will say nothing sinful. I heard a preacher say it like this years ago. He says, if you watch what you say, if you don't talk as much, then you find yourself not having to repent as much. Because sometimes people who run their mouths a lot usually end up stumbling in some way by what they're saying, not knowing how to control their tongue. And so we got to be people who know how to control our tongues and control our attitudes for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we got to make sure that we are walking um, with a level of discipline, a level of discipline, even in what we're speaking, what we're saying and what we're doing. So David is saying, God, you've scrutinized me. And this is one thing we want to do with ourselves. We want God to assist us and to show us if there's something in me that's not of you. I need you to reveal it. Now, some stuff God ain't got to say. You already know certain characteristics, certain traits, certain qualities, certain things are not godly. And so now we got to make sure that, hey, I want to be developed and conformed into your image. So there's going to be pressure applied to begin to develop in something because whenever you're developing, there's going to be a level of resistance that's given and that's demonstrated to now cause you to say, okay, if I'm going to walk in love and develop in love, that means something unlovely is going to happen around me. That's going to challenge me to walk in love now. So God, even with examining, show me my right motive, show me the, the motives of my heart. Cause I want to be right. I want to do what's right because it's right and do it right. And so 
I just want to be right with this thing. I was talking to Bishop Fuller, um, uh, who's our overseer over ministerial association, and I was just talking to him about a message and, um, that I preach, and I think I asked him about it for him to listen to it or something, and um, just to see what he, what he thought. I was like, man, I just want to get this thing right. He's like, man, I'm the same way. I want to get it right. We all want to get it right. No matter how long we've been in this thing, I just want to make sure that I'm not sharing something with God's people that's, that's not of him. And so my heart is to do what's right because it's right and to do it right. And, and there are times, yeah, I know, you know, and this is where we begin to check ourselves because if we're walking in the love of God, the love of God gives the advantage. It doesn't take advantage. The love of God gives the advantage. It doesn't take advantage. And so I think that's always important for us to understand. Now, in the book of Psalms, the 24th Psalm, verse 4, same translation, New English translation, it says, The one whose deeds are blameless and whose motives are pure, who does not lie or make promises with no intention of keeping them. The one whose deeds are blameless and whose motives are pure who does not lie or make promises with no intention of keeping them. So are you that type of person? Are you a person who lies repetitively, habitually? Are you, yeah, are you a habitual liar? Are you a person who makes promises but doesn't intend on keeping them? That's even what the scripture calls a covenant breaker. That sometimes we say things but don't intend on following through. And so that's a lack of love. That's a lack of honor. That's a lack of respect. And so this is why, too, you know, in the past, um, I try to be real mindful about that now, about even um, uh, just saying things in the moment to, to not just to appease, but to say, hey, OK, yeah, I'll do that. Or let's go ahead and get that done or let's da 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 da. And sometimes I got to stop and say, can I really follow through with what I'm getting ready to promise, what I'm getting ready to say? Because in the moment, my intent was right. But then I got to really judge that because if I don't follow through, that can mess up a relationship and it can now uh, it, it can put a stain on my character and my reputation to say, OK, this person, you just talk a lot. You say a lot, but I never see follow through. So we got to be mindful of stuff like that. And so um, now one thing um, I was taught and trained in was even like don't don't promise stuff. And, you know, the people even after you finish preaching. Because when you preach and the anointing is on you, and a lot of times as people are coming up talking to you, you can start saying, yeah, this and yes to that. And, and okay, because sometimes you're in that giving mode, you're in such a flow, you're in such a grace that I even had one point, I used to have my assistant to be right beside me just to let me know, uh, Pastor, we'll make sure we'll get back with that in just a second. Because I even told them, you know, because sometimes not even trusting myself because I love the people. And so now sometimes somebody might come up and talk and say all of these things. And so I had to be mindful because I wanted to make sure I follow through what I'm saying I'm going to do, not just to, for the moment to say, okay, yeah, 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 I will, I will. But now then go back and think, am I really going to do it? You know, and sometimes I have to be honest with people. I'm not sure because I have a lot of stuff to do in a particular moment. And I'm not even sure if I can get to that at that time. But I'll make I'll do my best to try or I'll try to get it done. Now, some things that I can do, I'll say, yes, I can definitely get this done and I can definitely do it. But I've learned because this is part of my character and this is part of character development. And I want to make sure that my motives are pure, and my motives are right. But it'll also help protect you from people who have wrong motives. It'll give you an opportunity to settle down, to evaluate, to look at and to see things um, where people are concerned. So um, I, I want us to make sure that we are people who. Now, let me, get, let me get to this line. It's amazing how many Christians lie. I mean, just flat out tell <laughs> falsehoods. And I tell people this, that's one thing I've always worked on, not, not to be a liar uh, and not to be deceitful. Because you know, it's like, it's not like you told a lie, but you withheld the truth. And you say things like that, but you know the ultimate goal of it is deception. Because you're trying to make somebody think one way about something that's not true. So this is why we got to check stuff like that. That if we see we're doing things that are deceitful, we really have to check ourselves 
and say, you know what, God, I know this is not right. When I really follow through and think about it, the reason I'm doing it this way is because I'm really trying to be deceptive to get something that I want. And we need to check those motives. That's not the love of God. Because now we're taking advantage of somebody. There may be rules set and we're always looking for the loophole. Or we're not, you know, always trying to buck the system. And I get it. Certain systems like you got a challenge and I'm not talking about that. But if you're a person who's always deceptive, you have an issue with lying. You really need to, to start working on that to even put yourself on the car, call yourself on the carpet. You know, I, I used to do stuff like this. Um, if I, if I said something, I was like, you know what? No, I'm lying. I'm not going to do that. I catch myself in the middle of it and even say it, man, I'm lying. And sometimes that might take people off. It's like, dog, you just was real straight up about that. And I was like, no, I'm working on something because I want to make sure I'm not just saying stuff just to be saying it, but I want to be a man of integrity. I want to make sure that I, the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. I want to make sure that I'm a person you can count on me when I say something. So I really want to work on that. You know, even for like a parent for children. Yeah, we're going to go here. We're going to do this. And I began to say, like, I used to do that with my children sometimes. And it was like, man, my heart was to do it. But then I found myself coming up with excuses not to do it or allowing obstacles to stop me from doing it. And so when you begin to now put your word on the line, put your name on the line, you got to sometimes do whatever you have to do to protect your integrity to follow through with what you say you're going to do. That's just as much love as anything else because that helps the person that you're dealing with and that you're working with. Now, in the book of Psalm 26, um, this is the uh, verse two. This is out of the new living. Now I'm just laying this, this, this foundation in the word. He says, put me on trial. Psalm 26, two in the new living translation. David says this, put me on trial, Lord, and cross examine me. Test my motives and my heart. How many of us will really say that honestly to God? God, test me. Test my heart. Try my heart. You can trust me. We talk a lot about trusting God, but I like to bring this up at times. Can God trust us? <clears throat> Have we started working on our character to say, God, I'm asking for big. I'm asking for greater. But can you trust me to steward what I'm asking for? Are my motives pure in what I'm asking for? Why? You know, stuff I ask, why do I want the big ministry? Why do I want the influence? Why do I, why do I want it? Is it just for people to know my name? What is it about this thing? You know, and, I, and these are things that you got to check because, Lord, don't put me in a position if my character is not ready to sustain it yet. Because I don't want to be a public success and a private failure. So now if I'm really working on, and this is why the system strategies and the structures are so important, because some system strategies and structures will help you develop and sustain your character. See, to keep you in the love, to keep you walking in good character and standing, not doing certain things, not being certain places, not being by yourself around certain people whatever it is, how you do business, conducting yourself well because you don't want to be a covenant breaker. So I don't want to go into an agreement that I can't afford. I don't want to go into an agreement that I know I shouldn't go into. And so that's character, that's love because the other person on the other side of that um, transaction is depending on you to keep your word. It's things like that that we always got to make sure that we work on. This, this is stuff like this, you know, um, for, from a cultural standpoint. You know, and, and we hear these in jokes. I hear comedians have said this stuff. We say it jokingly, you know, like bad, black folk got bad credit. You know, that, that, that's a sign that you back it. If your credit score is under this, then you black. And it's like, come on, man, really? And it's like just from the mindset of that. And we laugh at stuff like that, but that's not cool and that's not good. So that means we can't conduct business. And now that begins to show other people. They have a mentality that, okay, see, this is these are stigmas. And these are things that now in a society, they'll begin to look at you a certain way because you even look at you a certain way. 
See, all of these things, self-love. Do you love yourself enough? Do you love God enough to say, I want to be your representation in every aspect of my life? I want to get this thing right, Lord. I want to be better at this thing. What is it that I need to do to grow? What is it that I need to do to get better? This is the year of transformation and change, of manifestation of the sons of God. He says, I'm ready to put you on display. So that means from the inside out, from your spiritual walk, from how your soul is, from how your body is. You know, do you, you know, we just got to get it right. He says, you know these things You've been taught a lot of these things. Now it's time to put them into practice consistently to see the transformation and the, and the change. The 32nd Psalm, verse 11, um, it, it says it like this. Um, and this is the, uh, the God's word translation. The God's word is like, yeah, it's a bunch of different translations. It says, be glad and find joy in the Lord, you righteous people. Sing with joy all whose motives are decent. Be glad and find joy in the Lord. He says, you righteous people, you and I, we're the righteousness of God. He says, sing with joy, all those, all whose motives are decent. Sing with joy, all whose motives are decent. Our motives are to be pure before God. You can, you can sleep well when your motives are right. You can, and sometimes I know we can have right motives, but wrong methods. That's, that's a bar right there. I need you, I need you to, I need you to write that down. We can have right motives, but wrong methods. And so we want to learn the methods as well as with the motives. And so a lot of times we talk about conflict resolution. And so we, we, we can try to use the method, but sometimes if you use the method for manipulation, that's the wrong motive now. If you're trying to control the narrative and you say nice things to control the environment or the atmosphere or control people, let me say it that way, to be controlling and manipulative to, you know, and sometimes we know how to work people. When you study people, you know how to work people. You know which buttons to push. You know which things to do. You know, what is your motive? Get back to that. Judge yourself. What is my motive? What am I really trying to do? Am I trying to get in good with this person? And so now I give you flattering words because I'm looking for a position. Be mindful what you do. If you're going to give, if you're going to give to somebody, give with no strings attached and even be mindful of gifts that you receive because strings may be attached to those. What are the motives? This is why sometimes you have to be mindful. Some things, yes, yeah, some, some gifts you may have to reject because there are strings attached. Things that people may give because they want to control the narrative. Like if you're doing business, if you're doing things, I remember this preacher was talking about, um, it was these, these three investors that came and said, Hey, we want to invest in your ministry. And, um, they talked about everything that they could do and, and to give us like, we could take you worldwide. And it sounded so exciting to the preacher. Then the Holy ghost came to the, I think he had a dream, <coughs> excuse me. And God showed him that strings were attached to that gift from that group of guys because they were going to come in and try to control the ministry and control him as to what they wanted him to do. And so God said, don't receive anything from them. And then God ended up bringing the necessary funds from another source. So don't get so excited, calm down, set, settle your emotions, think it through. God will give you wisdom to know what interactions, what transactions to take. He'll show you. And so, cause sometimes we can go so pure that, and I want to use the word, cause I know this is the word I want to use is naive. Sometimes just because we're green, we don't know. And so we just love everybody. And so we are just trusting of everybody. Like my wife and I, that's so funny, man. I think coming up, I was one of more of those trusting people. My wife is native New York. She's brought up in certain environments, you know, so she would watch people. Now I consider myself a street smart person a street savvy person, but because I love people so much. And I think sometimes I would give people opportunities, but she would be mindful. She would see things and she'd be like, Mike, watch, watch them. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh man, that's cool. You know, I can handle it or they not like that or whatever. And she's a seer. She'll see things. And it's like, watch it. And sure enough, you know, usually something comes up and it was like, yeah, you was on it. You were right. 
And so that caused me to sit back and say, don't get so excited, you know, about opportunities that people say, you know, what, what I like to call Hollywood talk. Sometimes we do that, you know, and I've done it. And my, and see, and that's why too, I give people the benefit of the doubt because, and this is a part of my love walk and my development, because I've been that person at times that my intention was pure when I said, let's do this, but my follow through wasn't good. And so that's the area I said, God, I want to be a good person, a follow through. I want to be a person who stands on what I say, that when I say things, this is why too, the scripture talks about your words won't fall idly to the ground. Why? Because now you even trust the words that you say, because if you saying things, but don't follow through, you'll begin to, um, 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 lose faith or credibility in your own words. So now it causes you to be stagnant in God's word because you don't even trust yourself to follow through with what you need to do to get things done. So then all of a sudden it causes you to now hold back and not even want to go and possess what God has because you don't even trust yourself to do it. And God says, I want to restore that. And so what you do is you restore it by obeying and following through. You regain the trust by following through. You check your motives and check your heart to make sure that I'm doing this for the right reasons. I'm doing what's right because it's right and I'm going to do it right. Okay. So this helps. This is part of the love walk. This is part of the development. This is part of us growing. Okay. And be a person and be honest. See, this is when I talk about the lying aspect. Sometimes we are, we, we say what we need to say to get what we want in the moment. Because say, if you, if you talk to somebody and this is what comes with with expectations and sometimes relationships don't work because we're lying about our expectations. We're really expecting one thing, but we're afraid that if we truly tell them what we're expecting, it'll cause them to leave. So we'll say is what's what, what in the business world you call, uh, um, um, uh, not false, yeah, false advertising or what's called bait and switch. You say a thing to get people in then switch on them once they're in. It's like, wait a minute, I, you didn't say this. This is the fine print in the relationship. You didn't tell me X, Y, Z. You told me this. Well, I just did that to get you. Now that I got you, now that you, you're switching on them. And so people can't trust people like that. You're not trustworthy. And so that's deception. And if you don't, if you start digging deeper, it goes into witchcraft. When I, what I mean by that manipulation tactics. So whatever you lie to get, you have to manipulate to keep whatever you lie to get, you have to manipulate to keep. And so now you got to go back and you got to keep doing deceptive stuff to now control people. And you gotta, we gotta watch that type of stuff and we have to learn how to be honest. And to really share because the honesty and how we feel and what we're thinking and let God adjust our thought patterns. And sometimes it just may be a preference. It may be just the way we want to do something, but at least when we come into the, the, the relationship and we are making, it's really making covenant when we're talking to people, when well, I'm dealing with relationships now, when we come in, you know, it, <laughs> Honesty is still the best policy, but then the scripture says, speak the truth in love. So we got to be honest as to why we really want to do this, what our heart really is, what our expectations really are, because we want to be honest with the person because we value their time, their heart, and we want to protect their heart just as much as we want to protect our own. That's a right motive. That's a love walk <clears throat> and to be truthful about it man, I truly want to see you win. So I'm not coming into this just to get the advantage. And I know that any great transaction is a win-win for both that I want to make sure you win. You want to make sure I win. And so when we, when we come at it like that, then we begin to see things work out a lot better. So our motives must be pure. And so in first John, I want to take this is within it, but a little pivot is going back to this love that now in first John two, seven through 11, first John chapter two, verses seven through 11 in the new living translation. And it reads here, he says, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you, 
Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. So when you stop walking in love, you turn off the light and it's hard for you to see things. And so when the love of God is in play, you begin to treat people different. You talk to people different. You act differently. And so this love walk helps you to stay in the light. It helps you to see areas because now I'm, I'm going to have to go for sake of time. I'll go and begin to talk about the attributes again. On Thursday, we talked about, I read through the attributes and characteristics of love, but we got to really go through that and begin to see that when I'm walking in love, you will begin to see how it just transforms and changes me. It'll change you. It'll change you in a way that your whole life will start being conducted different. We just think walking in love is being that person we see on TV that just smiles all the time. It just, you know, has this soft demeanor and, and things like that. But love is more than that. Love will also mean that we need to have a hard conversation because I love you. We need to settle and squash this beef because I love you, because I'm determined to walk in this love. Then that means it's going to take strength for me to do this. We talked about strength to love. And we talked about even when um, uh, Doc, in Dr. King's book, The Strength to Love, his wife, Coretta Scott King, she began to give the foreword on it. And one of the things um, she said that her husband dealt with, and even with just, just the whole walk that he lived, it was like, you know, we, we say things like uh, uh, freedom is not just necessarily given by the oppressor, but must be demanded by the oppressed. But also walking in this love is not just the responsibility of the oppressor, but also of the oppressed. That we got to make sure we have the right attitude towards people who have even done us wrong. Jesus talked about that. He was like, I want you, you don't just do good to people who do good to you. Because he was like, even sinners can do that. People without a covenant can do that. But it's like, I want you to treat your enemies right. And that, that's one of the hardest things for people to do is to treat somebody well that that did you wrong that dogged you out and so he said this even amongst now here in first john he's talking about believers he's even talking about because there's so much even tension amongst believers people lawsuits and and things of that nature and even the scriptures talk about how can you who are in the light go to a person in darkness an unbeliever and take your matters to them for them to judge you whereas you're supposed to be a believer and you're supposed to be able to squash this and walk this thing out and and the sad part is that there are some people that won't allow you to be at peace with them in the sense of even the scripture talks about be at peace with all men wherein it's possible because some people are just determined to see things a certain way and to do things a certain way. So it's almost like you have to love them from afar. Because now if they come in your vicinity, they're trying to disrupt your peace by now antagonizing you consistently and constantly. And it's like, Lord, you have to help me with this while I'm developing in this thing. Okay. All right. I, I, listen, that can be baby mama drama. That can be family squabbles. That can be a bad business deal, a business deal that went wrong and went sideways. You know, you bring money into any equation. Then it's people like, well, man, where's my money at? You owe them $5. And they're acting like you owe them 50000 Even the scripture talks about the person who owed one person a certain amount, and he was forgiven, like an enormous amount. And it was like he went to somebody, the person who was forgiven, went to somebody who owed them a small amount. And he like choked them and was like, give me my money. And the person who forgave him of the debt he owed heard what he did. It was like, no, 
And it angered him. It was like, wait a minute, I forgave you or all of this and you couldn't even forget that person or that amount? He's like, man, throw him in prison until he paid me back. And so it's stuff like that. It's like our attitudes towards people. This, this is supposed to change our attitude. Our attitude should be getting better. Let's just be honest about it. We should be getting better, y'all. All of us should be getting better at this. We, there, there should be less division. There should be less squabble. You come in with a bad attitude, everything all right? Why you got the attitude? You know, settle your emotions down. It's going to be okay. Huh. Huh. Okay, settle down. Get your emotions under check. It's cool. And sometimes it's through misunderstanding. I didn't even know that. I apologize. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. So they come at you sideways. Your job is to try to squash it. We all got to work on that. What you mean you ain't doing that? What you mean? So what are we doing? You know, God wants us to change. And as I was getting ready for this, he was like, no, this is for transformation. This is not just to preach some information. This is for transformation. This is for revelation. This is the living word of God that's supposed to come into our souls and get out the darkness. Let the light shine so that it can shine on darkness and get out of us stuff that's been in us all along. And the light shines on it and we begin to see that's how I've been walking. So I need to change and everybody need to repent and our attitudes and how we treat people and how we treat one another, how we talk to one another. So this is a transformation we all have to go through. So this doesn't end because the series ends like last year doesn't end system strategy and structure. You still need system strategy and structure in 2024, just like you needed it in 2023. So this is, this, this compounds, this grows, this develops. We increase more and more. And that's how we're supposed to develop in this thing. And so the, the interesting thing about this scripture is he says this, he says, for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I'm living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. You are already showing me you're living in darkness. If you hate that brother or hate that sister. You, we got to be, man, we got to deal with this stuff because there's a lot of hatred going on in the body of Christ of how people are talking. You see it all over social media. You just see, you, you sense the venom in conversation. And it's like, man, you trying to say something, you might be saying the right thing the wrong way. So it's the wrong thing. You might have a valid point if you just said it better. If you didn't come in so angry all the time with it, maybe somebody would receive it. So like, let, let's deal with this stuff. And I hate seeing it. I just turn that stuff off. I can't even finish listening to somebody who's coming across like that. It's like, I'll turn. It's like, okay, you're not even coming with the wrong spirit. I mean, you're coming, you're not coming with the right spirit. That just seemed like the wrong attitude. And I, and I get it. You know, everybody a gatekeeper for the kingdom of God. Everybody think that their way is right. And you can be just as wrong as the person you're coming against. Self-righteousness. So, and I get it, because you think that you're a defender of the faith, and you got to expose this person and expose that person. Why don't you sit down and take the beam out your own eye before you're looking at the speck in your brother's eye? It's amazing how we forget certain scriptures while we're trying to uphold one set of scripture that we forget the other set of scripture. And then all of a sudden now, because you this big defender, you're not walking in love or compassion. Can you have a civil conversation? Man, there's just too many hateful Christians out there. And I don't like it. I don't like it. God doesn't like it. There was this one time, um, I think I was in prayer. This happened a couple of times. But when you get into a, like intense worship and intercession, and it's almost like you tap into the heart of God and you begin to sense the magnitude of his love. The love of God, it says the goodness of God that causes men to repent. There are times where like I can sense it and I just break down and weep and cry. And it's like, if it's anything, Lord, forgive me. And it's like, because I'm sensing just how good you are and just how much you love people and you love your creation that 
it's like, man, you can't help but to be transformed when you encounter that type of love, that type of mercy, that type of goodness. And it settles you down, whereas you ready to go at somebody and when, when it's like you're ready to squash that beef when you encounter this love. When we're, when we're baptized in this love and developing this love, it'll help squash stuff. It's like, man, it's not even worth it. It's not even worth it. And so we want to be mindful of those things. The book of John 13, 34 through 35 in the New Living Translation says it like this. So now I am giving you a new commandment. This is Jesus speaking to love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So listen, and then John 15, 12 says the th same thing. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so he says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love proves that we're his disciples. Love proves that we're his disciples. Love proves that we're his disciples. The love of God proves that we're disciples of Christ. So what does this love look like? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, the Amplified Classic Version. The attributes of this divine love. Love endures long. Love is patient and kind. Love endures long. Love does not give up on people so quick. Love doesn't cancel. We're quick to cancel folks. The, the one at one moment they do something wrong, you ready to cut somebody off because they did you wrong. Okay, love endures long. How long has God endured you? But he, that's God. He's God. I ain't God. Okay, but his love has been deposited in your heart. I'm talking about people who are Christian. I ain't talking about people who, who, are born, who are not born again, who are spiritually dead or separated from God. I'm talking about now the people whose nature has been changed, where this love has been poured in our heart. I'm talking about Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking folk. I'm talking about all of us have to be that. We have to endure it long. And so that means, and watch this, and it's patient and kind. So it says endure is long and it's patient and kind. Patience is not just putting up with something. Patience is being consistent and constant and the same. But then he says, I want you to be kind. Are we kind towards one another? And one of the biggest places to start working on that is, number one, in your own household. Can we be kind to one another? Can we be patient with one another? Can we be long-suffering with one another? And so we got to check ourselves and say, and this is why we got to stay in the mirror of the word, because if we leave, we'll forget what manner of man we are. So we got to stay here to keep reminding ourselves, this is how I need to act if I want to develop in this. Then he says, love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. Envy and jealousy are two different things. Jealousy is like, I want what you have. Envy is like, I don't even want you to have it. <clears throat> like, it's, it's like you, you are discontent, and it's almost like a strong discomfort, sometimes anger for some people to see somebody excel and you don't. You, you, it's like you hate the fact that they're winning. And sometimes it comes from the fact that because you aren't and because it's a self-inflicted thing. But sometimes it's like, it's like winners like being around winners. People who are successful like to be around successful people. But it's the people who struggle, the people that nothing is going on, that now it's like you become envious and jealous of others because you think they got it all together. You think they rising to the top and they may be. But don't you know you can have your own success as well? If you work on developing yourself and doing the things, and sometimes love will say, let me, let me cross over the street and see what are you doing to get that, and it'll begin to change your attitude towards people if you learn how to work together. And you'll begin to see, because then you already, watch this, this is what Satan will do. He'll give you a, a mindset about somebody until you really talk to them, you'll begin to see the thoughts that came to you are not exactly what the truth is. So you got to really talk to people because sometimes this is what we call, it's almost like evil surmising, thinking bad of someone or something without any real proof of it. And we have to be mindful of that. 
I don't just go by all the time what other people say about people. I like to have my own experience with them. Because sometimes the way you dealt with them is different than how I deal with them. And so sometimes it's like you got to know how to deal with certain people certain ways and you'll get better results and better output if you know how to interact with them a certain way. And so sometimes that's a people skill. That's relational intelligence. Knowing how to have right relationships with people and how to have proper relationship and say, okay, this is an outer court relationship. This is an inner court. This is a whole as a whole. It's not too many people can come into the whole as a whole. But I, I, I can recognize based off of the information I've obtained through my interaction with you, I know how to categorize this now. So even my expectation isn't too high or too low. It's just right for this interaction so that now I'm not, I know how to treat you better. And love will begin to say that. Love will even protect you from you and protect others from themselves. See, all of this stuff goes into play. See, all of this stuff works. Oh, that's good. Love will work wisdom. Love will bring up wisdom in you as to how to work this thing out, how to handle this. God's love in us. Because we, and he says this, it's not boastful. It's not vainglorious. It's like, it's, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't brag on itself. It's not boastful like I did this, I did that. It's one thing we talk about, you know, you hear things people say boasting in the Lord. And then sometimes people say bragging on themselves. Some people, they say they boast in the Lord. They still, they, they actually bragging on themselves but they try to cover it up with the spiritual language. And then sometimes you got to hear the, the spirit of it. There are some people who are genuinely boasting in the Lord. And so we do have to be mindful of these things. And so how are we doing this stuff? How are we saying stuff? How are we coming across? Then we do have to think about that because if we want to speak the truth in love, we want people to be able to receive the, 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 the communication that we're trying to give them, the information, the impartation, whatever it is we're trying to get them to get, we want them to receive it. So how we do it is important. Love is not, it doesn't display itself heartily. It's not arrogant, man. <clears throat> I don't know about y'all. I've been in spaces and places where I just picked up the arrogance on people in certain places. Christian environments, churches. And it's like, ooh, yeah, you got your Louis bag, but it's like, mm, it's like the, the air that you have about you. And it's like, I, and I'm like this, I could be wrong. I could just be seeing this. Or uh, I, could, I could be misreading this. And sometimes people treat you, when people treat you a certain way, if they don't think that you can do something for them, then they dismiss you. But now, you know, we got to judge ourselves and not say stuff like, okay, I'm going to show them. Yeah, my success going to punish them. Okay, even with that, that's still the wrong attitude. Why even worry about that? Just do what you're supposed to do. Do what's right because it's right and do it right. Let God get the glory out of it and we move on. Why everything got to be tit for tat? This is the stuff I'm talking about. Hey, we, we know this is things that we deal with internally. And we got to check ourselves as to what we're doing. And so because God's love is supposed to reign supreme, not our desire or what we want to do. Now, I'm, I'm really out of time, but I, 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 I want to wrap this up real quick. And I want to tie this in because I want to because this is so important that he says this. Love isn't conceited. It's not arrogant and inflated with pride. It's not inflated with pride. Not just the arrogance attached to pride, but pride that's saying, I don't want you to know what I'm going through. I don't want you to see my deficiencies because I'm afraid that you're going to treat me different, see me different, act different towards me. So that really is motivated by fear. And when love is in operation, it begins to eliminate fear. And so it's like I'm an open book because I love God and I love people. And because I love people so much, I just want to get it right. So I'm willing to do what's necessary and receive whatever information, whether it's rebuke, correction, development, whatever I got to do to get this thing right, I'm willing to do it. Okay? So this is important for us to understand. This is important for us to know. And so now he says love, God's love is not rude. It's not unmannerly does not act unbecomingly, 
And this is something we just have to work on. Rudeness. Stop being rude. Stop saying stuff that you know is wrong. So now it's like, man, because I'm so used to doing it and it's become such a part of my character, this is where renewing of the mind comes into play and to just say, nope, I, I can't do that anymore. And that takes work. That takes discipline. Sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you may not get it, get it right. You get it wrong. But the thing is, nope, I'm, I'm working on doing better in this area because I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be unmannerly. I don't want to act unbecomingly, it says. Love, God's love in us does not insist on its own rights or its own way. And how many of us want to insist on our own rights? I got a right to this. And so we have to work on that. We have to really uh, uh, flesh that out and see how that works because you could talk about rights. You know, somebody can take that scripture and take it out of context and say something like a civil right. To say, okay, we have a right to do this, but we're being mistreated. But now, love, if you go further down, love rejoices when right and truth prevails. So it's like, just treat me the way I'm supposed to be treated. Some people think that civil rights meant that a black folk wanted better rights. It's like, no, nah, we don't want better rights. We just wanted equal rights. We want to be on the same playing field. We cool with it. We can work with this thing, but it's like, don't try to put me down to bring you up. So when right and truth prevail, I'm like this, I'm going to walk in love, but at the same time, walking in love does not mean you can't demand certain things. Um, so you got to, but it's the attitude behind it. And sometimes not insisting on your own rights or your own way may mean you forfeiting something that you think you have a right to, but watch what happens. God will open up a door to give you greater than what you forfeited. And some people can't handle it. No, I got to let them know. I got to, I got to, I was just watching somebody that's dealing with this very same thing. I was watching something, a video, and very well-known people and going back and forth. And one of the people was like, you know what? They were just telling their part of the story. And it was like, you know what? I just gave up, you know, I'm the one that started this, did this. I was the visionary. But then it was like, God just said, let it go. And what I'm going to give you is going to be far greater than what you're letting go. And sure enough, God took that person to a totally different level. Totally different level. And you just saw the fruit of it. And so how many people could do that? Versus, no, I'm going to sue. And I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to show you that you ain't going to take advantage of me. Well, you got to use wisdom. What if God speaks to your heart and says, let it go? But if I let it go, they're going to think that I'm a punk. If I let it go, they, they're going to think they can take advantage. I tell people all the time, just because I give you the advantage doesn't mean you're taking advantage. If God says, let it go, just let it go. And your excelling and your increase is not going to be See, we, 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 and sometimes that secret desire, that's why the light shining on those dark areas, the secret thing of, uh-huh, that's going to show them. Uh-huh. They're going to wish they ain't treat me bad. Well, so what? What if they don't come back and say anything to you? So that means that now your success is lessened because that person didn't acknowledge I did you wrong? Can you keep on moving in life? If they never apologize, praise the Lord. Okay. Now watch this. <laughs> it pays. It's, it's, it's not, <clears throat> it's not self-seeking. It's not touchy, fretful, or resentful. It's not touchy. Stop being a touchy, sensitive person. What you mean by that? How come you had to say it that way? It's like, oh my goodness. Sometimes people, and that's the culture we in right now. It's like, man, I was looking at a TV show and I was laughing at it, but that's kind of how the culture is. It was like a person said something as simple as they went to this restaurant and they wanted to make a reservation. And the guy behind the counter said, we don't use the word reservation um, because we don't want to um, uh, offend Indian people. I'm like, OK, but it was it was you know, they were making a joke of it because that's just how the culture is. But it's like, come on. All right. You know, even even as black people, there's certain things that I hear people say and people do. And some people just go off about it. I'm like, really? You, you, you that touchy about it? You're that sensitive about it? 
You know that's not who you are. So why are you even giving them power by even responding that way? They're going to, listen, man, we're in this world. The devil is still loose. We're in this world, but not of this world. And if you go off over every little thing that, ha that happened and is being said, how strong are you in your faith and your love? Well, we got to get better with certain things. It's like, man, why are you tripping over that? Everything ain't racism, but there's a lot that is. So now, watch this. There are certain laws that you can legislate, but you can't fully legislate a changed heart. You can't legislate. Some people just got to get born again and their heart has to be changed. Their mind has to be renewed. But now you put laws in place so that now they can't legally do things to you because their heart hasn't changed. So I, I totally agree with that. But I'm just saying some stuff, when you're walking in this love, it's like, it's like what off a duck's back. You dismiss it and move on. And then you pity the person. It's like, you so full of darkness. You don't even have a clue. You in such darkness. Now watch this. Well, is there a time that we can do something that we just want to do? <laughs> and I get it. Sometimes you just want to let her rip. It's like, Lord, just, just let me lose on the one time. It's like, nope. Uh, and sometimes he'll say, I want you to say, I want you to go ahead and address this. Talk about it. But see, then, oh, that, man, that's good. I believe, I believe that God will do that when he knows he can trust you not to take it overboard. He'll release you to say certain things because he knows you know how to control your tongue and your temper and your actions. Because you have graduated to a place where now he can elevate you to deal with certain things. Strength to love will elevate you. Right motives will elevate you because he can trust you. Because certain rooms he's about to move you into, he can trust you in those rooms because you won't switch on them once you get through the door. Hmm. That's good. Love does not rejoice at injustice or unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. We rejoice when right and truth prevail. We rejoice when right and truth prevail. It takes no account of a suffered wrong done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It takes no account of evil done to it and pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It pays no attention. When you think about that, I pay no attention what you did to me. I was thinking about that just yesterday with something. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to give energy to something because that, that holds you in bondage. If I'm loving you and you maybe don't respect me to the degree, maybe I think you should or whatever. Hey, to me, I look at it as almost like that's your loss. Because I know who I am. And I'm here to bless. I'm here to be a blessing. See, when you go in servant mode and looking to give, because I'm not looking to you to receive validation. I'm not looking to you to receive my reward. My reward comes from God. And when I come from with, with a servant's heart, I'm just looking to bless you. The love of God doesn't say I love you, but do you love me? The love of God just simply says I love you without the condition of you having to say it back to me. This is strong love, y'all. This is supernatural love. This ain't natural human love. This is why we need Jesus for this. I can't do this without him. I can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of this love. The third person from the Godhead who's come to abide on the inside of us and to strengthen us. Because even in Jude, in Jude 20, it talks about praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up like an edifice high and higher. Then it says this, keeping yourselves in the love of God. When I pray in the spirit, it helps to strengthen me in love. It helps to, for me to restrain myself. The love of God constrains us. The love of God covers others. The love is holding me back from cussing you out. The love is holding me back from knocking you out. The love of God. You better be glad I'm walking in this love so that the wrath of Mike don't come on you. So, and then God's like, what you doing? 
Don't even talk about the old man. Well, back in the day, if there was me back in the day, man, I'll listen. Why are you even rehearsing? Because what you're trying to do and what Satan wants you to do is to dig up that old man. He's dead. He's gone. She's dead. She's gone. You have a new life in Christ. We don't function like that no more. So stop talking about old stuff. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to flex a little bit. You're trying to say something, let people or put people on notice. You know, I love Jesus, but I'll put these hands on you. Uh-uh. I'm sorry. That's counter Christ. We laugh at it. And I, I get it. I get it. We say stuff. See, we got to we gotta watch this stuff. See, this is the stuff that appeases to the flesh. I'm hood and holy. I get what you're trying to say. But if we true to being a Christian, what are we going to do? That doesn't mean we just weep back. We just sit back and, and all those type. I'm not talking about that. But some stuff we try to use to give ourselves. Some people say stuff like this. We got to have balance in life. And you say balance. I heard people actually say this. You need a little ratchetness and righteousness. Who says that? God don't say that. You say that. Like, come on, y'all. Then you follow and listen to people like this and you agree to it because it appeases to your flesh because you just want to do that. Yep. I want the benefits of heaven, but I want the pleasure of the flesh. So I want to make sure I do this thing. And God's like, listen, you can't have it both ways. You can't fully now walk in this, this glory that you're talking about you want. If you constantly walking in the flesh and letting your flesh rule you, it just don't work like that. I'm sorry. And we got to, we got to deal with that. I get it. I listen. I get listen. Trust me. I get it. I get it. And there are moments I'm like, God, help me. He says, you already know what to do. You already got it. You developed enough. Just just allow me to shine through you. See, when you're weak, I'm strong. And Jesus, I'm going to allow you to shine through me. I'm going to allow you to shine through me. And that, no, it, it, it hurts. It crucifies the flesh. That means that part of that crucifying feel like, ooh, that hurts. Ooh, Lord. Whoo. Okay, okay, okay. Help me in this moment. And sometimes you need people around you. All right, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You know, it's kind of like when they go low, we go high. No, I want to go low with them. And I want to go lower. I want to hit them where it hurts. So that they can't even cover, not to even think about coming back at me again. Well, what's that going to do? What's that going to do? He said, it's time for us to be baptized in this thing. It's time for us to walk in this love. It's time for us to practice this love. And so now we got to do it in Jesus name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We give you glory, we give you praise, and we give you honor. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Now, if there's anybody out there under the sound of my voice who's never heard of you, who's never received the Lord Jesus, we pray that you will begin to mend their hearts and begin to touch their hearts. Let them know there's a literal heaven to gain and a hell to shun. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And we just give you praise for it today. Now, if you're out there today, you never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you want to today, I want you to repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were raised from the dead for me. Come inside my heart now, Lord Jesus. I make you the Lord of my life. Say, Satan, I no longer belong to you. Jesus is my Lord, and I'll serve only him all the days of my life. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me your son. I'm saved now. I'm born again. I have eternal life. Now say this, say, Holy Spirit, come inside me now. I ask that you live and dwell in me. I ask that you abide in me. Now, according to the word of God, as I've as according to the word of God, I've asked you to come in me. I believe that you dwell in me. 
I receive you now. In Jesus' name, I now have the ability to speak with other tongues as you give me the utterance. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to begin to do this. Begin to lift your hands. I want you to begin to pray. I want you to begin to praise God. I want you to begin to give him glory. Begin to open up your mouth. Begin to speak. The Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, but thus spake ye of the Spirit. And he'll begin to assist you in talking. And not anything in your known language, in English or whatever language you speak. He'll give you words to begin to speak. They'll sound weird to you. But the Bible says this, he's giving you this language that you speak directly to God. You also build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So, Father, we thank you for this love that has been shed abroad in our hearts right now by the Holy Spirit. And we make a determination to walk in this love, to develop this love, to demonstrate this love, to show this love in our homes, towards ourselves, towards others. As you have loved us, we'll love others. And so we thank you right now that we demonstrate that character and that development of that character. So we thank you for it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. Lastly, if you need a church home, we, we're, hey, God is leading you to join this local church. Listen, you can also join our e-church family. Whether you're here in the Richmond area or surrounding counties, um, you can come and fellowship with us at the Stonebridge Community Center. Uh, information is on our website and on our social media platforms. You can go and find out um, excuse me, how to come and fellowship with us in person. But if you're online in a different uh, state, country, hey, you can be a part of this global network, this global ministry, this global fellowship a fellowship of believers where we come together for a common goal. Amen. Our, our vision is as we manifest the love of God through act of goodness and kindness, our goal is to teach people their authority, rights, and privileges as believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, pursuing their purpose, igniting a passion and fire for the kingdom of God, revealing to the world the true sons and daughters of God and blazing with his glory. As you begin to develop in your walk with the Lord and begin to go in your different walks of life, that God will begin to manifest through you, to you, and manifest through you to, to meet the needs of society, of humanity. He'll meet your needs. He'll begin to teach you as to who you are so that you can walk in it in every sphere of influence in life. Listen, if you're a teacher, to be the best teacher he called you to be, a doctor, to be the best doctor, a lawyer, the best janitor, I don't care what it is, best homemaker. God says, I, whatever I've called you to do, I've graced you to do it. And I want, you to, I want you to take me everywhere you go. Okay? And so we want to help you in developing your relationship with the Lord, understanding who you are and whose you are, and all of this power and authority that is at, that's at your disposal. We want to help you. If that's you and you want to join um, this network of believers, we want you to just go ahead. This information is up on your screen. You can send an email to us at connect at spiritoffire.us. And for those that got born again or filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to hear from you. We're believing for 1,000 salvations this year. We've already started out the year, about seven, eight people, seven maybe, I think it is. And uh, we want to add more. I believe it's been more. Um, but listen, we want to add you to that number. We want to celebrate. Heaven rejoices over one person getting saved. And so we just thank God for your life being transformed and changed. And we want to be there to help you um, with your spiritual enrichment and edification. All right. Okay, y'all. Well, at this time, we want to honor God and our giving. Um, there's information coming up on your screen. There's a QR code that you can scan. Uh, we like to call it Opportunity for Prosperity because we honor God in our giving. And so even as we honor Him in our giving, through you, whether it's your tithes, your offerings, or gifts of love, that as we do it, not as an obligation, but as a desire and a delight. That even in the book of Genesis, that when Abram came and gave, Mel, excuse me, gave Melchizedek tithes of all from the victory that he had just won, 
I think it was the Battle of Chedorlaomer, and he came and he gave tithes of all. And um, there was, he said, there was bread and wine. In other words, um, communion between the high priest Melchizedek and Abram. And so Abe, then Melchizedek said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And so we begin to see that Abram brought that tithe, not as a command from God. God didn't command, but he did it freely and willingly. That was a free will offering unto the Lord, that he offered 10% of everything that he brought in from that battle. And so we begin to see that. So we saw that, that he just freely did that. And even going now into this new covenant, that we begin to see that as you begin to give, God says, whether you do it, he said, I don't want you to do it grudgingly or of necessity, for I love a chill forgiver. He says, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. So what does that mean? Bountifully and sparingly. That can mean um, frequency, but also dollar amount. That how you give is how you receive. It's the law of reciprocity. So if you give every now and again, you get every now and again, just like a harvest in the natural. If you sow seed in the ground maybe once a year versus planting multiple seeds, that listen, what level of harvest do you expect to get? Likewise, but God multiplies the seed sown. So you are the determining factor. You can determine your harvest by determining your seed. That's up to you. And so now the thing is, what is it that God is laying on your heart? What is it that you're believing for? What is it that you're looking to give, that you're looking um, to do? And so we want to honor God in our giving. And honor, part of honor is, is the level, is uh, reciprocity, is giving. It's a response to God's love and his get, goodness. And because he loved us, we want to show our love and appreciation to him. So we honor him with our gifts of love. And so whatever it is God is laying on your heart, we want you to go ahead um, and we're going to be dealing with this subject soon. I'm going to be teaching on it in more detail. Um, and I know I promised that for a while, but I'm going to be hitting it this year, um, probably within the next coming months, that I'm going to be really just digging with some things and kind of settling some things and saying, okay, this is what I believe the Word. This is what I see in the Word of God. This is what I believe God is showing us where our giving is concerned and what we need to do. And so I believe that we're to honor God in all that we do. Okay, he says this, honor me with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your bonds be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. And we just see that when we give, God says, I'm going to give back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. I'll cause men to give unto your bosom. But he said, with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So what is it that God is laying on your heart? We ask that you um, just seek God as to the seed that you're to sow. And we thank you that it helps us to fulfill the vision and the mandate that God has given us. And so you see that information on your screen. If you desire to sow and to send in your seed via mail, um, the address is on your screen, P.O. Box 13423, Richmond, Virginia, 23225. You can make out your checks to SOFF, that's sufficient. And like I always say, you spell million, M-I-L-L-I-O-N. So you can give via Cash App, Venmo, you see that on your screen in text as well. All right, well as you give, we are in agreement for increased success. We declare that you're out of debt. All needs are met. You have plenty more to put in store. And we thank God for your continued financial support. Amen. All right, y'all. Well, I'm out of time, but certainly not out of message. Don't forget, next week we will be in person. Um, and so we just thank you, for, thank you for tuning in today. Love on one another. Enjoy your family. Enjoy time with one another. We love you. We speak God's blessing upon your life. We declare that all is well with you. We speak his great grace and great power upon your lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Peace.